Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about abolitionism. In this flipped classroom, I hope that you stop the recording when you need to hear something again. Also, there will be several times when you're going to read or I'll read aloud with you. Feel free to stop and do that in your textbook as we are progressing through the lecture. Okay? So, here we are in the years following the revolutionary period. And in those years, there are many tensions about who deserves freedom. During this period, we see a movement of women seeking the right to vote and individuals black and white, north and south, seeking an end to slavery. There are a lot of tensions between the north and south. In 1787, as our nation is expanding westward and forming a new government over those lands, we have five states that enter the Union as free states. Uh, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and parts of Minnesota. All of these places in the Midwest enter as free states. Later, uh, due to some frustrations from Southerners who were surprised by this, Henry Clay, the great compromiser, orchestrates the addition of Missouri. As, um, and, and under the addition of Missouri, there remains a balance of free and slave states. So the Southerners are a little bit happier. After Henry Clay's compromise, uh, California is admitted to the Union after, after the gold rush in 1850. They're admitted as a free state, and the slave trade was prohibited under this law. So in response, the Southerners are angry again, and uh, to, to appease them, a new act called the Fugitive Slave Act was passed in response. So this made ordinary citizens very complicit in the apprehension and the return of runaway slaves, and anyone who assisted them could be fined or imprisoned. Okay, so I've just thrown a few things at you. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787, okay, the Missouri Compromise and Henry Clay, the Great Compromiser, and the Compromise of 1850. And all of these things lead to tensions, guys, that will eventually take us into the Civil War. I want us to, together to read and summarize the Underground Railroad to Freedom on page 333 in your textbook. There's a particular person I want to introduce you to. This is Harriet Tubman here. And um, Harriet Tubman was a runaway slave and abolitionist who guided about 300 fellow runaways to freedom uh, as one of the most famous and successful conductors on the Underground Railroad. Okay, so we're going to read about the Underground Railroad in your textbook on page 333. Please follow along. Northern abolitionists and free black people risked their lives and safety to help enslaved people escape to freedom through a loosely organized network known as the Underground Railroad. Although it was not underground and had no tracks or cars, this escape system used railroad terminology to describe its actions. A secret network of conductors hid runaway slaves in farm wagons and on riverboats and then moved them to designations in the north or in Canada, sometimes even as far as England. Using complex signals and hiding places, the Underground Railroad carried its passengers over hundreds of miles of dangerous terrain. Underground Railroad conductors had to be resourceful and daring, and one of the most courageous was Harriet Tubman, a Maryland-born fugitive slave. She was known as Black Moses because, like Moses in the Bible, she led her people out of bondage. After her own escape in 1849, Tubman made almost two dozen trips into the South, guiding hundreds of slaves, including her own parents, to safety. Southern planters placed a large reward on her head, but she was never captured. Several fugitive slaves pushed, published dramatic escape stories that inspired black Americans and struck fear in the hearts of white Southerners. In one account, six-foot-tall Henry Box Brown described how he had, he had himself packed into a small crate and shipped from Richmond, Richmond, Virginia to the Underground Railroad agents in Philadelphia. Light-skinned Ellen Craft and her husband William made their escape by posing as an invalid gentleman and his loyal servant. So there were many ways that people took advantage of this. Other abolitionists that I want you to know are uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe and a few others. Uh, we're going to talk about white abolitionism and black abolitionism and the different ways that people would have conducted themselves as abolitionists. Let's just say that white abolitionists could push the envelope a little bit further. So Harriet Beecher Stowe writes a little book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. She was, uh, it was one of the most influential books in American history. And her father was a pastor of a congregational church, and her brother was a preacher. And after the death of one of her children, it made her contemplate the pain that slaves must have endured when their family members were sold away. So she decided to write a book about slavery. And with the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852, she became a national celebrity. She went on to write several more books on the topic, many of them in response to Southern critiques of the original. 
So during her 20s in Cincinnati, Ohio, Stowe developed the idea of this unbreachable boundary between right and wrong. She became very moralistic. And in the context of this renewed sectional debate over slavery, the acquisition of new territories, and the infamous fugitive slave law that formed as part of the Compromise of 1850, she began publishing Uncle Tom's Cabin in a series of installments in the National Era, which was a popular weekly paper. Though her write, uh, through her writing, Stowe uh, sought to shock her readers. She sought to, to reach their Christian consciences on behalf of African Americans. So in 1852, when Uncle Tom's Cabin was published in its entirety, it sold half a million copies within four years. It was translated into hundreds of languages, and by the end of the century, her book had sold more copies in America than every other book except the Bible. So despite the popularity of her publications, um, this mother of six never made much money from writing, so she remained very deeply religious and was a, re a supporter of reform movements, and often we would see that with many abolitionists at the time. I'm going to read you a passage from Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. My master traded with one of the men and bought my oldest sister. She was a pious, good girl, a member of the Baptist church, and as handsome as my poor mother had been. She was well brought up and had good manners. At first I was glad she was bought, for I had a friend near me. I was soon sorry for it. Sir, I have stood at the door and heard her whipped, when it seemed as if every blow cut into my naked heart, and I couldn't do anything to help her. She was whipped, sir, for wanting to live a decent Christian life, such as your laws give no slave girl a right to live. And at last I saw her chained with a traitor's gang, to be sent to market in Orleans, sent there for nothing else but that, and that's the last I know of her. Well, I grew up, long years and years. No father, no mother, no sister, not a living soul that cared for me more than a dog. Nothing but whipping, scolding, starving. Why, sir, have I been so hungry that I have been glad to take the bones they threw to their dogs? And yet when I was a little fellow and laid awake nights and cried, it wasn't the hunger, it wasn't the whipping I cried for. No, sir, it was for my mother and my sisters. It was because I hadn't a friend to love me on earth. I knew I didn't. I never knew what peace or comfort was. I never had a kind of kind word spoken to to me until I came to work in your factory, Mr. Wilson. You treated me well. You encouraged me to do well, and to learn to read and write, and to try to make something of myself. And God knows how grateful I am for it. Then, sir, I found my wife. You've seen her. You know how beautiful she is. When I found she loved me, when I married her, I scarcely could believe I was alive. I was so happy. And, sir, she is as good as she is beautiful. But now what? Why now comes my master, takes me right away from my work and my friends and all I like and grinds me down into the very dirt. And why, he says, I forgot who I was, he says, to teach me that I'm only a nigger. After all, and last of all, he comes between me and my wife and says I shall give her up and live with another woman. And all this your laws give him power to do in spite of God or man. Mr. Wilson, look at it. This isn't one of all those things that I have that have broken the hearts of my mother and my sister and my wife and myself, but your laws allow and give every man power to do in Kentucky, and none can say to him, nay. Do you call these the laws of my country? Sir, I haven't any country any more than I have a father, but I'm going to have one. I don't want anything of your country except to be let alone, to go peace, see, peaceably out of it. And then when I get to Canada, where the laws will protect me, and laws will own me, that shall be my country, and its laws I will obey. But if any man tries to stop me, let him take care, for I am desperate. I'll fight for my liberty to the last breath I breathe. You say your fathers did it. If it was right for them, it's right for me. That's a segment of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Tom, Uncle Tom's Cabin. She did this to make an impact on Northerners who were conflicted about slavery, and it worked. I'm going to turn to another abolitionist today, one who was known as possibly a madman, Nat Turner. Um, on August 13th, there was an atmospheric disturbance in which the sun appeared in this bluish-green color, and it was the final sign for Nat Turner. And a week later, on August 21st, he and six of his men met in the woods to eat dinner and to make their plans. At 2 o'clock that morning, they set out to the Travis household, where they killed the entire family as they lay sleeping. They continued on from house to house, killing all the white people they encountered. Turner's force eventually consisted of more than 40 slaves on horseback. About midday on August 22nd, Turner decided to march toward Jerusalem, the closest town, and by then the word of the rebellion had gotten out to the whites. Confronted by a group of militia, the rebels scattered and Turner's force became disorganized. 
After spending the night near some slave cabins, Turner and his men attempted to attack another house but were repulsed. Several of the rebels were captured. The remaining force then met the state and federal troops in a final skirmish in which one slave was killed and many escaped, including Turner. In the end, the rebels had stabbed, shot, and clubbed at least 55 white people to death. Nat Turner hid in several different places near the Travis farm, but on October 30th, he was discovered and captured. His confession, which he dictated to physician Thomas Gray, was taken while he was imprisoned in the county jail. And on November 5th, Nat Turner was tried in the Southampton County Court and sentenced to execution. He was hanged, then skinned on November 11th. In total, the state executed 55 people and banished many more and acquitted a few. The state reimbursed the slaveholders for their slaves, but in that hysterical climate that followed the rebellion, close to 200 black people, most of whom had nothing to do with the rebellion, were murdered by white mobs. In addition, slaves as far away as North Carolina were accused of having a connection with the insur an insurrection and were subsequently tried and executed. Another rebellious way to resist the Fugitive Slave Act was, of course, to join people like Harriet Tubman on the Underground Railroad. There were several symbols that, uh, that people used to guide them their way through the passage to the north. The first was a quilt. Quilts are blankets made of patchwork of different materials. They often show important events in life, and during the Underground Railroad, quilts were hung from the front porch of houses, and they told runaway slaves that the house was a safe place for them to find food, shelter, and help. These safe houses provided runaway slaves with food and shelter on their way to freedom. They were houses of people who did not believe in slavery. Today you'll even find some here in St. Louis, near the river. These people hung quilts and lit lanterns to show runaway slaves that they would be safe there. Conductors were people who guided runaway slaves to freedom, like Harriet Tubman. They would show them the way to safe houses and help them get supplies and help. Many conductors returned to get more slaves and risk their lives, um, and again, runaway slaves who could be returned to slavery if they were caught, such as Tubman, acted as conductors. The North Star is the brightest star in the night sky, and slaves used it to find their way through the woods. So runaway slaves had, uh, had to move mostly at night, and this shiny star showed them the way. There was one more thing. It was called the Drinking Gourd. It was a constellation. Looks like the Big, big Dipper to you. It was a group of stars, um, and runaway slaves called it the Drinking Gourd because it looked like a bowl and the ladle used to drink at that time. This was another way for slaves not to get lost in the dark. This map shows free states and slave states and areas with slave populations that were very high uh, in 1850 and the routes of the Underground Railroad all going from the south to the north. You can see that St. Louis is on the path from Mississippi to Illinois and it was a very important stop. We'll talk about two more abolitionists. Uh, I want you to read on page 283, Garrison's Demands for em Emancipation. William Lloyd Garrison was one of the most prominent and uncompromising abolitionists of the 19th century. He published The Liberator, which was an anti-slavery newspaper from 1831 until the day that all American slaves were, were freed, 34 years later, under the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, he also organized the first anti-slavery society in New England and co-founded the first nationwide organization, which was the, an the American Anti-Slavery Society. So Southerners and anti-abolitionists often condemned him, him as this troublemaker who sought to sort of incite or otherwise um, contented slaves to insurrection. So he might have inspired someone like Nat Turner. And he was a pacifist his whole life, and Garrison did, did celebrate the notion of slave rebellions um, after a, a guy named John Brown failed a raid on a, a federal arsenal in Harpers Ferry, Virginia to, in order to, uh, to protest slavery. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about him later. Garrison was anything but a moderate, though. He, in uh, 1832, he published Thoughts on African Colonization, which uh, was the idea that we could send former slaves back to Africa. Uh, he, he responded that this was not the way that the abolitionist movement should go. Uh, this is going to be part one of this lecture. Please tune in to part two, which is also linked here shortly.